Welcome to the Green Wasp Removal YouTube channel. Green Wasp Removal offers non-toxic, environmentally responsible control of wasps, yellow jackets, and hornets in northeastern Indiana, USA. In this video, we study a Polistes metricus nest that was captured in the wild on May 21st of 2022 in northeastern Indiana and was relocated into captivity. We're filming the development of this nest as it grows and we'll be sharing the progress with you by posting update videos on this channel. The Polistes metricus paper wasp is very common in North America. It's a native species to this continent and is very common in the Midwest. Here in northeastern Indiana, locals might see metricus foundresses or queens coming out of winter hibernation in March and beginning to seek out and establish nesting sites in late April. The female wasp that established this nest is called the foundress or queen she had established this nest on the underside of a children's play structure outside a local community center, so the nest had to be relocated for the safety of children rather than have it destroyed. It's important to relocate these nests when we can. This one, of course, is in captivity just for study. Typically, you're going to want to relocate these nests rather than kill them off because metricus wasps are quite important to the local environment. They are great controllers of other insect populations which they use to feed their larvae. So they'll help you maintain your yard and your garden by removing the pests you don't want. Like most wasps, they're also good pollinators. So you don't want to kill wasps if you don't have to. And you certainly don't want to poison them uh, and poison the environment at the same time and poison your living space or your yard and all of that. So green wasp removal is a very strong proponent of utilizing green alternatives to pesticides. This is the way the nest looked when we first found it underneath the children's play structure. We removed the mother from the nest just briefly to get these pictures. You can see she had deposited one egg in each cell already. Uh, she's also provisioned the nest with some nectar, which is the shiny sort of goldish honey looking drops of liquid inside the nest. Adult wasps will live on nectar primarily and sweet liquid carbohydrates that they find like honeydew and that kind of thing around the environment. They generally only get protein by killing insects and maloxating them or chewing them up into pulp for the larva. The larva actually lives mostly on protein where the adults live mostly on liquid carbohydrates. We attempted to introduce a Polistes fuscatus wasp into this same habitat but the female metricus uh, was not in the mood for a roommate. She kept lunging and getting quite aggressive towards the other one. So we had to remove the fuscatus again from that habitat. You can see in a couple of these slow motion clips, mama metricus wasn't having it. The reason we attempted this experiment to put them together was because in the wild, studies have shown that the metricus will share space with another nest from a fuscatus nearby, and sometimes they've been even seen to share a single nest with a fuscatus, which is something we thought would be worthy of an experiment, but uh, didn't work out. We did not want harm to come to either one of them, so we had to separate them again. When it comes to relocating wasps and putting them into a captive study position, uh, the least we can do is try to make their lives comfortable. So once we had the metricus set up on her own again, we started hand feeding her various insects uh, because she's going to need that protein to feed the developing larva. Here she's maloxating a spider. Maloxation is a process of chewing up something into a fine pulp, and that is what she's doing here, and that is what all wasps will do with the insect protein that they collect for their larva. They'll chew it into a pulp, and then they'll feed it to the larva mouth to mouth through a process called trophallaxis. Basically, she cuts off all the hard legs and bits, and then she'll take the meat of the insect and chew it up into a viable pulp for the larva to eat and this takes several minutes to accomplish. Eventually she'll bring it up here to the nest and she'll feed it to the larva. So we're gonna speed up the clip on fast forward so you can see the process in a much shorter period of time. You'll notice this wasp, like most wasps, has tremendous dexterity in her legs and she uses her four legs and feet like we use our arms and hands um, to manipulate things that we carry or touch and they are quite good at that and they roll the food into a perfect ball and they actually get some fluids and some protein themselves through this process. But the majority of the protein is later fed to the larva through trophallaxis. You'll notice the torn up paper and the wood 
that's inside the cage. Uh, this is there in case she wants to use any of that for nesting material because they actually construct their nest as they go along and they use wood fiber and sometimes paper fiber to do that. They break the fiber and cellulose down with their enzymes in their saliva and that turns it into a paste that they can sort of use like paper mache to create pretty amazing structures. She's climbing up to one of the other nests we found in the wild. This uh, is another metricus nest with eggs in it. We were hoping she would adopt it and start maintaining it, uh, but I'm not sure she's going to do that. But here she's sitting on that nest and continuing with the malaxation process. So we'll speed it up again for time here, but she really works it until it's able to be fed to some very tiny little larva. Here back at regular speed, she's done with the malaxation process just about, and she's going to fly off with a ball of pulp in her mouth, which is how they carry it around. She ended up returning to this nest, which wasn't her nest, but she was looking for larva. It only had eggs at the time, but I think had there been larva in this nest, she may well have adopted it. Here she heads over to her own nest. She has to walk around to the other side of the cage. And when she arrives there, she checks on her nest. And she decides from that point to do some more malaxating of that spider meat. And uh, she goes ahead and does that for a while. So I'm going to speed this up until she's done. Here you see her leaning into each cell. And this is where she does the trophallaxis process, where she has mouth to mouth feeding. Trophallaxis is actually a two-way process for the wasps. The mother creates protein for the larva, and the larva creates a sweet carbohydrate fluid for the mother. So they both kind of feed each other through this process, so everybody wins. Here we've moved forward in time to about June 3rd of 22, and you can see the eggs are now starting to develop into young larva, and they are similar in color to their mother. They're kind of purplish, maroonish and uh, that is the color they will become as adults when they look like her, when she's sort of brownish, maroonish, and black. In order to keep up with the food needs of the nest, now that the larvae are starting to develop, uh, we had to begin to bring in mealworms from a pet shop to have enough protein to keep giving to the metricus mother. The great thing about mealworms is that they pretty much mimic what the metricus wasp hunts in the wild uh, as food for their larvae. Metricus wasps in particular go for a lot of caterpillars and insects that are still in a larval or a worm stage. So in captivity, mealworms stand in pretty well for that kind of prey. The outer hide of the mealworm is probably a little tougher than the wasp would usually hunt for with the typical caterpillar. But the wasp mandibles are, are so strong that they can get through it and turn it into pulp for the larva without much trouble. Here we shoot a little bit more in close-up so you can really take a look at the structures, the physical structures of the wasp, the mandibles in action, and the neck structures, and the wing structures, and the pulsating abdomen, which is the lower half of the wasp. It pulsates because that's how they breathe. It's similar to our lungs. And you can see how there's hooks on her feet that keep her pretty securely attached to whatever she stands on. Despite the toughness of the outer part of the mealworm, she's able to do quite a good job at malixating that into a pulp for the larva. The mandibles are really quite strong. So we'll just speed this along here a little bit, let her finish up. As she gets close to completing the malaxation process, she comes back to the nest and you see her checking on the larva here. She just makes sure all her babies are good and then she finishes up the malaxation process and starts feeding the larva. Once the larva are fed, she does a pretty extensive cleanup. Uh, wasps are very, very careful to groom all the time. Uh, it helps keep the nest clean, helps keep their bodies clean, and that prevents disease and issues with all sorts of things. Here's a little closer look at the developing larva and some eggs in the outer cells. So far they look healthy and they seem to be adapting well to captivity. Here the mother starts to do trophallaxis with one of the larva, mouth-to-mouth -mouth feeding, and she'll do that with each larva periodically. I apologize for the shaky camera work. Uh, 
It's a little awkward to get the camera into the habitat to be able to film this, uh, but fortunately we got a good look at it. It always reminds me of a nest of baby birds. The larvae become more active and move around more when they feel the vibration of feeding happening. It's not unlike what birds do, in fact, with the regurgitation of food, very common in the animal world. As the larvae get old enough, they will begin to spin silk caps that cover the cells that they're each in. And once those silk caps are in place, they'll begin the pupation stage like a cocoon, and they will emerge from that stage as adult wasps, worker female wasps, which will help maintain the nest and help forage for food. And then the queen, or the dominant foundress here, will begin mostly focusing on laying eggs as opposed to maintaining the nest. Here we hand feed the foundress with mealworm. Sometimes if we feed them the entire worm, it's a little too much for them to wrangle, so we have to break it into smaller pieces for them. Most wasps will spend a great deal of their lives hanging upside down. Most of these nests will be downward facing, so the larvae hang head down and the foundress will have to feed them in that position. So the wasps are quite good at hanging upside down for extended periods of time. It also helps the debris from feeding drop away to the ground, away from the nest. It helps keep the nest quite clean, actually. So we'll speed up the last bit of this for you. And I'm always struck when I see this, how incredibly efficient these wasps can be quickly feeding the larvae. They have a lot of little mouths to feed and they are quick about it. It also amuses me to watch them do trophallaxis with the tiny little larvae uh, that are so small, you, you can't quite get a good scale of that here, but those larvae are truly tiny. Uh, it's almost sweet the way they interact with each other. It, like they're just, exchanging these tiny little smooches to get nutrition and the big mother wasp is just so gentle with them. Of course that contrasts with the other side of the wasp world which can be pretty brutal. I mean wasp queens will often have to pull their own larvae out of the nest, eat them, and then regurgitate those larvae to the surviving larvae. This happens during food scarcity times when they need more protein or this will happen if a larva is sick and not thriving or if if there's a dominant queen that's trying to establish dominance over other queens, she might pull the other queen's larva out and pull her eggs out uh, and then eat them and replace them with her own larva and her own eggs. It always seems that Mother Nature is such a contrast where some things just seem so pretty and so gentle and they're so easy to watch and then other things are just so brutal and seem so ugly in nature that it's kind of mind-boggling, the contrast. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. There'll be plenty more to come as the 2022 wasp season progresses. So stay tuned and have a good one.